I really praise God for what he's teaching us here in these studies in ethics. I really trust that there's just something that, if you're like me, there's, there's an intangible there that you're wanting to get a deeper understanding and a deeper hold that's, that's very real, that's right beside you. You can feel it right there. Amen. And what it has to do is, is with is, is deliverance from this wrong form of teaching concerning the law and concerning grace. Right. And I praise God for what he's showing us. I, I really do. I thank the Lord for that because, you know, grace is what Christianity is all about. And if we don't have grace, we're not a church. We're not Christians. We're just deceiving ourselves here. We're Old Testament Israel. We're a false religious cult or whatever. If we don't under understand some of these deeper principles of grace and these deeper principles concerning principles as opposed to laws and regulations and rules and these various things. So I didn't mean to go into so much detail here because this could easily be dealt with in theology, but you see how it also fits into the ethical situation. You really have to understand a lot about principles or would get over there to a text like Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5 a person would misunderstand a passage like that. And I wouldn't, nor could I, complain about that or fault them because they haven't had proper teaching. As a matter of fact, if anything, we've all had wrong teaching when it comes to these areas of law and grace, when it comes to these areas of what God requires of us in our life. It's always been, for me anyway, most of what I've heard, most of what I've heard, and it's all out there in charismania, is wrong teaching. And even if it's right teaching and wrong emphasis, it's still wrong teaching because that's what comes out. You pick up things that are not intended by the Holy Spirit for you to hear. Maybe that's what the minister intends, but God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't intend for us to see these things. Now, the only people that you'll find, I found a few good theologians, and generally those are the only ones, because if you're not a theologian, you're either a legalist or an antinomian, one or the other. I've only found a few good theologians, good conservative, non-charismatic theologians who have a deep grasp on this business of grace and law. And there's something about a grasp on that, whether you're filled with the Spirit or not, but we know that that's normal to be baptized in the Spirit, it just causes you and your personality to glow and to shine. It's the glow of the glory of the gospel of Christ and not the darkness of the fear and the judgment of the Old Testament. And so you ought to strive to have that recognized in your life. That you're a person who recognizes that you're under grace. That you are under grace. Romans 6 and verse 14. That you're not under law. It's Galatians 5, 1. You've been set free from the yoke of bondage. Don't be entangled with that again. And people so often go out of Egypt to go into Babylon. They're freed from some entanglement in some denominational non-charismatic system to go into the same thing under a different code or heading or title from Egypt to Babylon in the charismatic movement. And there's still more bondages that you find there. Amen. And I'll tell you this, you can mark it down wherever you want to, that it's rare you'll meet a man of God who knows that he's under grace, who knows and knows what that means to know that you're under grace person like that doesn't have a weak conscience. I'll tell you that. And I'm not saying that I know all about grace, but I know that my wife has said many times to me, I'll do something, and she couldn't do that. And she said, wow, I said, your conscience is free. That doesn't bother you, does it? And I said, no, it doesn't bother me. And I'm not talking about doing something wrong. Obviously, that would bother me if I did something wrong. It's just that if you're not totally enlightened, you just get all bound up in these various things. And I would do something, and it happened just this week, and she said, wow, you sure don't have a weak conscience, do you? You know, the Bible speaks of people who have a weak conscience. It just <coughs> bothers them about everything. Their little laws and legalisms, they're trying to remember all of them and do all of them. <laughs> and they've got a weak conscience. I've got, I believe I do have a strong conscience, that I just do these things, and I'm not sitting there pondering and worrying and wondering like a lot of people do. There's more we could say about conscience, but you know that scriptures speak of that by name. A weak conscience, a defiled one, a seared one, and so forth. And one thing I don't think I have is a weak conscience. That makes you strong in doing things. But the only way that you'll ever have that is to understand that you're under grace, that you're under the loving protection and concern of your Heavenly Father that sent Jesus to the cross to bear all your sins away. And so you possibly, you couldn't possibly fall down in utter abject fear over one little thing that you've done wrong when all of your sins have already been judged in the body of Jesus Christ. 
And again, you have to understand grace or that leads immediately to antinomianism. As soon as you think, well, Jesus already took care of all of it, then even if I do make a mistake, and after all, we're all human, let's be realistic, we all make many mistakes in life, and you start going along that line, and that's kind of weaving away from Matthew 5:48. then. <laughs> so you've got to keep all of that together. Well, what I want to come to next are the proper Christian motives for conduct. They're numerous, and you may be surprised at some of these. <clears throat> and I'm going to be giving them to you in an ascending order which will mean that the latter ones are the more important ones where the Bible, the New Testament, puts its emphasis. But the former ones are not invalid. As long as they are taught and understood like we're soon going to teach now and understand them this morning. That's very important to know what, you, what proper motives are to make sure you've got them. You can't have something just by osmosis or just because you got saved. You just think that everything that you want to do is right because you're saved and God sanctifies you and your life by the Holy Spirit and that means everything is approved of God doesn't mean that at all so let's look at proper motives for Christian conduct in the first place now we're going to start on the bottom rung of the ladder and work our way up I guess you could say that some of the bottom rung motives are more easy to misunderstand misinterpret and misapply I think that definitely is true, especially the first two. Then when you compare those with some of the later ones that we'll get to. Okay, so the first proper motive is the motive of the fear of chastisement. Now that's the least important of the motives. The fear of chastening, of the Lord's chastening hand. Now, we purposely use the term chastening or chastisement rather than the word judgment or some other word that's a little stronger because the scriptures show that the Christian has been totally delivered and set free from the judicial penalty of God's wrath. The Christian is set free from that. Now, we're talking about Christians. We're not talking about church members. Now, this is going to go deep, and I don't know how well I'm going to be able to explain it, so just be sure that you listen carefully. I recognize no matter what I do the rest of the days of my life, if you are one of the saved elect, then you have permanently, forever, in all parts, been delivered from the judicial penalty of the wrath of God. That will not come at all in any measure on any elect believer. It doesn't matter what you do. You can go adulter you can go commit adultery, you can fornicate. If you're an elect believer, you can do those things. They did right in the scripture, people who were elect. You can believe in this, believe in that. If you are an elect believer, you'll never come under the judicial penalty of God. So we're not saying that the first proper motive is fear of the judgment of God because the Christian will not be judged in the judicial penalty method in which we're speaking. For instance, 1 Thessalonians, now 1 Thessalonians sets this forth clearly in two different passages, the first chapter and the last chapter. 1 Thessalonians 1, and I believe it's the last verse of the chapter, 1 Thessalonians 1. Now this is what you need to get a hold of. This will really set you free. It doesn't set you, Paul teaches in Romans 5 and 6, it doesn't set you free to sin. You never use your liberty as a license to sin. But as I've said before, whenever you keep people in bondage, many times that makes them do worse than they would if you would allow them to be free. Sometimes you can try to, you know, keep an animal caged up and just fighting at the cage. You let the animal out, he won't leave your yard. He'll stay right there. I've had that happen. It's remarkable. You put it in a cage and he didn't want to be there. You let him out, he's not going anywhere. He'll stay right around there. And it shows even the instincts of that animal there. They don't like to be bound. When you bind them to something, they generally do worse and they act their worst. You allow them to be free, and then they do their best. And it just, it just happens that way. And it happens with we who are believers. Praise God. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Uh, he speaks of these Gentiles in Greece where they had turned to God from the idols that they had been worshiping, and they were waiting for his son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And this is the judicial penalty of the wrath of God. And if you are an elect believer, Jesus has already delivered you from that. And then over in chapter 5 and verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, you might want to put a footnote to that verse. A lot of people use that verse as a proof text for the fact that none of the church is going through the tribulation period. But they're misinterpreting the passage. As a, as a matter of fact, the very passage will contradict that as we study that under eschatology. But many people will use that verse. God's not appointed us to wrath. And you know what's going to be poured out on this world during tribulation? The vials of God's wrath against mankind. And so since God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation, that means that no Christians will go through any portion of the tribulation period, which is not what he's talking about there in that verse. Let's leave it speaking of what we're speaking now, of the, of the judicial penalty of God. So fear of chastening is not fear of judgment, not in the sense that we're using the term. Because the scriptures teach, in the book of Romans, that all of the elect believers' sins have already been, past tense, dealt with and judged in the death of Jesus Christ. He bore our sins in his body. God's judgment for the elect believer's sins has already taken place on the cross of Calvary. See, God's not going to judge you for your sins. Even the passages that speak of judgment, and we've sp spoken of those recently, so we're not skirting the issue. No one brings them up, so we're brave to bring them up. Romans 14, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, those are not speaking of the judgment of the believer for his sins. Speaking of something else entirely. Nor do we mean by fear of chastening the fear of condemnation, that God will condemn you because of what you do wrong. We're talking about a proper motive. Why do you do what you do that's right? Well, I do it because I'm afraid that God will condemn me if I don't do what's right. No. That's an improper, that is an unchristian motive. Romans 8 and verse 1. There is how much condemnation to those that are elect believers. There's none at all. But what if you do something? Well, he didn't say what if. He said there's none at all. A lot of people can't handle what I'm saying right now. Right. They just can't fathom that. But what if I commit a gross sin in the eyes of God? Well, he said there's none. There is no condemnation. Your sins were condemned when Christ was made a curse. Galatians 3.13. That's all already been dealt with. And to give you a passage from Jesus' own lips, John 3 and verse 18, a proper motive is not fear of condemnation, not fear that God's going to judge you judicially, but it's a fear of the chastening hand of the Lord that we'll get to in a moment. We're looking at it negatively right now. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You're not waiting for future condemnation. If you're an unbeliever, the wrath of God, verse 36, is on your head now. You're condemned now because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So from Jesus' own lips, when you believe, you are not condemned. The condemnation that was due you and your sins has been imputed to Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, and you're free from condemnation, you're free from judicial penalty, you're free from the threats of judgment that so frequently are heard today. Now, the lost man, we're not talking about the lost man, but I'm going to tell you what is the desert of the lost man, and you'll find out that a lot of people are preaching messages as though they're preaching to lost men. Romans 2, verses 5 and 6, there's the desert of the lost man. Or Matthew chapter 3, whenever John Baptist warns those Pharisees, what does he say? He says, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, you cannot preach a message like that 
to a group of elect believers because they're not fleeing from the wrath to come because they've already been delivered past tense from the wrath to come. They're not fleeing from judgment. They've already been judged. All their sins have been judged in the person, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. They're all judged. They're all dealt with. And so many people will use a verse, that's even a New Testament one. Of course, it's before grace and Calvary and everything, but they'll use a verse like that to preach messages to people who are saved. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? If you don't really get on the ball with God, watch out because he'll judge you and you'll be condemned. No. The, that's a form of Arminian ethics where you're preaching that fear to people who are already converted, and it's sub-biblical in the comparison with the New Testament. There's no doubt about it. The New Testament shows it to be sub-biblical in your threats of judgment to people who are already elect believers. Now, the New Testament labors the other point that we are the dear children of God, that he's our heavenly father. Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, we can even approach him in prayer like that, our Father which art in heaven, which shows maybe chastisement, Father's chasten, but you don't see him as the tyrant as he is made out to be by people even in the pulpit. Now, he's a tyrant to the lost man, but he's a heavenly Father to his children. What about Baptist sermons of hellfire and brimstone? Well, if evangelists are preaching them, they're valid then. Because we could turn this around and say we're talking about Christian motives for conduct. One Christian motive is the fear of chastening. What's a motive for a person to get saved? Now, it's, it's a low one, not the highest one, a low one, fear of going to hell. You think that's a motive to get saved? It certainly is. So these hellfire and brimstone Baptist evangelistic sermons are valid. Charismatic ones as well. They're valid as long as you're speaking to an unregenerate, unsaved audience. And yes, the scriptures warn us of hell, that don't fear him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. There's fear of future judgment. But you see, the believer is never taught to fear because of future judicial penalties where God is going to judge him for his sins, where God is going to condemn him for what he's done. And the scriptures clearly set this forth. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, we have the teaching, verses 5 and 6, I believe, the teaching concerning chastisement. Now, here's the motive that we're on, and here's the proper motive. You fear the chastening hand of God. Doesn't your son, your daughter, fear your chastening hand? Well, they should. Do they fear you that you're going to lock them in an outdoor icebox where it's uh, 50 below zero or 110 above? I doubt they fear that. That's a judicial penalty that's only reserved for people who are thrown into things like that because of their murders and adulteries and whatever they've committed. You know, for the penal prison system, throw them in boxes like that. Not your child. Not your own beloved child. Even though they've done something wrong, you don't do something. You don't beat them with whips and shoot them and abuse them with your tongue and embarrass them in front of their friends. But you may use the Board of Education with 12 holes drilled through it on their posterior whenever you get home. Well, there is fear of chastening. There is a chastisement of the father upon the child. And the father enjoys, it is a blessing to the father to see that the child fears them in the right way. We've said before that there's a different type of fear from Old Testament to New. We've already taught you that before, that the Old Testament is a cringing fear. In the New Testament, it's a different connotation entirely. As a matter of fact, you find that in the New Testament, only in a prescribed sense is there a margin of fear in the bond of love. And it has to be a margin of fear. Fear is not the emphasis. A margin of fear that can be maintained in a prescribed sense in the bond of love. But here in Hebrews 12, the writer says, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Now, he doesn't say judgment or condemnation or punishment. You see, we've used that before, the word punishment, but that's only for the lost man. The lost man should turn his life over to Jesus Christ because he fears the punishment of the consequences of doing otherwise. That is a valid reason to be saved. Not the whole reason, but it's a part of the valid reason to be saved. 
you fear the consequences of not being saved. That only makes sense. Amen. Whenever there is a pit before you burning with fire and brimstone, you should tell the truth if that's being held over you, that if you don't, you're going to be thrown into that. You're afraid of being thrown into that. Well, that's what hell's all about. A, a lost individual should be afraid. Now, there are other things that go along with that, such as for the first time you sense in your heart the love of God toward you as a fallen creature. I sense that. As a matter of fact, whenever I got saved, I think I sensed that more. But then a few days later, I sensed the other. And I thought, oh, am I glad I'm not going to hell. I didn't think too much about hell, you know, until after it was too late for me to go to hell, I was already saved. Praise God. Then I got thinking about it, and I thought, oh, what a terror. What a terror. And for different people, it happens different ways. I've taught that before, that sometimes I think some of you have been converted under messages of fear and judgment. That's okay. And others of us have been converted under messages of love and concern and, and God's grace. They're both valid. They're both valid. So that's for the lost man. We're only talking for the one who's saved now. And that's everybody here, I assume. We're talking to saved people. Don't faint when thou art rebuked of him in his chastening of you. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, well, it's proof of your sonship. We go on, he goes on down in uh, verse 11. There are positive benefits in all of this. See, what's the positive benefit in being judged judi judicial, judiciously? There is none, because once you've been judged, it's too late. It's over with now. <coughs> Verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hallelujah. So really I'm talking about a concept in the mind. Whenever you're presented with an option and you choose not to do it because you think that it's wrong, you can't do that because you're afraid of being punished. But you can do that because you're afraid God will chasten you if you do something in disobedience. And it brings glory to God to have children, whether they're sons or daughters, who are all in subjection to what the revealed will of God is so that they're afraid of the chastening, disciplining hand of God if they don't live up to what they should. You know, we were getting ready for church the other night. I think it was Wednesday night to give you an illustration that blesses an earthly father's heart to no end. And I think all of us were upstairs except Jonathan, and he somehow had gotten the back door open Maybe the back door was open and he got out the storm door. Anyway, he got out in the yard wandering around just having fun. And we were all upstairs. It was almost time to get ready to prepare to come to the body here. And he got, it was so quiet downstairs that whenever you've got young children, they get too quiet, you go look on them, see what's going on. You know they found something interesting. There wasn't a sound downstairs. And so we hollered down, you know, what are you doing down there? And he didn't respond. There wasn't a sound. So we go down there and find out he's out the back door and he's crying because the door is too tall, too high up to reach, for him to reach to come back in. He can push it and go out and he can't come back in. So she went down and let him in. I was still upstairs. And she opened the door real quickly and let him in. And it's one of those doors that has the arm that closes slowly by itself, the storm door. And she came on back upstairs. And about the time she got back upstairs, he just started screaming and crying downstairs. And so I went down there this time ready to paddle him because I thought now he decided he wanted to go back outside. And he can't make up his mind back and forth like that. And so I was going to give him a paddling if he was screaming down there. It was time to start getting ready. And he had his back away from the door, his face toward the door, and his hands holding onto that little black bar that closes the thing. And he had his back to me, and he was just screaming and screaming and screaming. And I couldn't see what was going on. I didn't know what was happening. So I walked up behind him, got down on my knees so I could be eye level with him to startle him whenever he turned around and tapped on his shoulder. And he turned around, and as soon as he saw me, he just yelled, Daddy, I won't cry anymore, I won't cry anymore, I won't cry anymore. <laughs> and I said, well, good, now what were you crying about? He said, my finger's crushed and it hurts real bad. And he just, you know, he was fearing chastisement there, that's what he was fearing. And he said, I won't cry anymore. And so I said, okay, and then he turned around, and he still had one hand holding onto the door, and I looked over there, and his finger was just crushed behind that thing. And so I asked him, he just got real quiet. I had to ask him, well, what were you crying about? 
And he says, my finger's crushed and it hurts real bad. That's what he said. My finger's crushed and it hurts real bad. And I looked over there and sure enough, the thing was just smashed blue inside that door. Well, that gives an earthly father unending joy to see a child respond like that when you're in pain, but you don't dare say anything because you're afraid of being chastened. And then whenever it's all over with, then you announce, you know, I'm about to die. Could you help me here now? <laughs> that blesses my heart. And I'm sure it must bless a father's heart where we're so in tune to please him. We don't want to be chastened by him. What did he not want? He didn't want a belt on his bottom. He, he didn't want that. He did not want to be spanked. And so he was willing to forego all of his pain and everything. And he was screaming at the top of his lungs. It must have hurt. That takes a lot of inner struggle and control self-control when you're in pain just to stop yelling and screaming and be able to come back down on a rational level and start talking again and for a two and a half year old to do that he's doing pretty good some of those of us who are older just keep on yelling the whole time no self-control at all it's because we don't have that fear in us of chastisement from our heavenly father like we should have and when you find out lo and behold that his fingers being mashed pink and purple and red and blue and he's not saying anything about that until you ask him about it. Well, it just really touches your heart. So although this is least on the rungs of the ladder and going up, it's an important one that we fear the chastening hand of the Lord, and so we do what is right. Now, Hebrews 10, verses 30 to 31, and Hebrews 12, verse 29, have to be understood in the sense that we've been speaking of the fear of chastisement where I said earlier that only in a prescribed sense is there to be a margin of fear in the bond of love. And those verses speak of God being a consuming fire and it being a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, you have to tread easily with passages like that because you'll misinterpret them and in doing so you'll interpret them in Old Testament line of thought a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because those under Moses' law died without mercy. And by the way, if you'll read both of those passages, he's using it in the context of the giving and the practice of the Mosaic law, Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 12. Those are good New Testament passages to threaten your people with if you're of a mind to. If you've gotten free from Old Testament, then you turn over here to 1031 and say it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What are you trying to do? You're trying to make everyone so afraid of the terror of God's judgment that they'll do what's right. Mm -hmm. And you need to go over from 10 to the beginning of chapter 12, where we looked at verses 5 and 6 and see the chastening hand of the Lord. There's one other verse I just thought I'd throw in so that you aren't thrown off by it. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 32 because he uses both words judgment and chastisement here i'll show you what he means by the word judge i think anyone who's intelligent could understand what he means here where he says but when we are judged then we're chastened of the lord well judge doesn't mean divine judgment or judicial penalty it just means when we're judged whenever god looks over our life and passes some decision on what we've done. You know, he's talking about the communion here. When we're judged or when we're reviewed, you could say, when God has reviewed us and seen that we did so something wrong, then we're chastened of the Lord. But notice we're chastened, we're not judged. You see, the judgment merely is a review to find out are we right or wrong. We find out that we're wrong because we've not discerned the Lord's body. Then does God judge us? No, then we're chastened of the Lord. So let's that verse throw a kink in your theology we've dealt with that okay let's come to another proper motive we got a lot so we need to move along another proper motive second from the bottom and it's just the opposite fear of chastening desire for reward now this is probably the most debated of the proper motives because of the history of corruption of this motive the desire for reward the Roman Catholic ethical system, with its erroneous doctrine of merit, has misinterpreted this idea, the desire for reward, and built a whole system and doctrine around it. <coughs> Medieval monasticism is a good result of their doctrine, where people thought that because rewards are promised us, I'm going to set my affection totally on these heavenly rewards that I have, 
and it becomes a works religion. All you're striving for is more glory, more glory, more glory in heaven. More rewards, more rewards, more rewards. Here's the statement you might want to jot down that I found to be interesting and something that I read, that an improper emphasis on present sacrifice in order to obtain maximum reward is the seedbed for pride and negativism. Mm -hmm. An improper emphasis. You see people who carry their crosses around like a crown. They're so proud of them. An improper, and they're glad that they've gone through more trials. Their life is a little more rugged than everyone else's. You know, the more I can sacrifice here in this life, the more rewards I can get in the next life. What does that lead to pride? Your pride, you are proud now over what you've had to do without in life. So here it is again, improper emphasis on present sacrifice. What you have to give up, forego in this life. An improper emphasis on that. So that you can gain maximum reward is the seedbed for pride and negativism. You get too negative against the whole world. Everything is, well, it's over in the next life. This world is just so wicked and so bad, I'll forsake all of this life so I can gain all of the next. And I think that's been shown in the history of the corruption of this proper motive and principle of the desire for reward, where people have placed an improper emphasis upon what they're going to get in the next life via what they've surrendered in this so that they're proud over the situation so that you may end up receiving nothing at all. Many times you'll find in this life, in the Christian life, that brother strives with brother to see who can get the greater reward in the kingdom. Luke 22 verse 24 speaks of this with Jesus when they were striving to see who would be the greatest in the kingdom. We're talking now about improper ways of looking at this proper motive of the desire for reward. It's happened again here in this church where people in their own privacy of your home or your bedroom or whatever speak of your desires of you just don't like to see others doing more than you. And so brother strives with brother to see who can get the greatest reward in the kingdom. <coughs> Luke 22, 24 begins a little account of Jesus' disciples. So works are not merely instrumental. Our works that we do, our good Christian morals and ethics aren't merely instrumental just so that we can gain reward. And they're certainly not meritorious, which is what the Catholic system has made them out to be. <clears throat> but rather, evil is to be avoided because it's evil. And the desire for reward is never to serve as the chief motive for Christian conduct. We're presenting a few negatives before we get into a few positives. The desire for reward is never to be the chief motive for Christian conduct. Because then you're going to end up with a charge of egoistic hedonism. You're just out to see what you can get for yourself. Now here's where a lot of criticism is leveled against the Old Testament teaching concerning peace. Now, I don't know if you know much about the Old Testament word for peace, but it doesn't just mean peace like we think of peace of mind. It includes such things as a large family. Yes, it does. Peace. A large family, flocks, herds, fruitful trees on your property, property to own, a home, as well as maybe finances if they've got some medium of exchange besides the barter system. So it includes prosperity, health, and long life. Now I listed those from memory. I think that's most of them. And you think that's kind of prevalent of the Old Testament. A righteous man, what did he have? He had a big family. He had flocks and herds. He had valuables. He probably had some property somewhere. If he was stable, maybe semi-nomadic, he probably had some date palm trees. He had some water on his property. Uh, he had friends. He was in good favor with others. He had his health. He had prosperity. He had, what's the other one? Long life. Long life. You know, that's promised many times in the Old Testament. It's long life, long life, long life. And so the criticism is that, well, this is the chief doctrine of the Old Testament, and it's made out to be that works are meritorious. And of course, that's not true, although that appears to be true. 
God said, we were in Deuteronomy 28, that if you'll obey me, if you'll do good, then all these good things will happen unto you. And it's chiefly seen in things such as the latter end of the prophet Job. What was his latter end? A larger family, more herds, more flocks, a longer life. Chiefly seen in two places, the latter end of Job and the 91st Psalm. Mm. Psalm says if you do certain things and all of these blessings, these various protections and prosperity and deliverance, and what does it end with? Long life. Long life will be added unto you. And so, because you desire all these things, then you live a good life. And some have even found it over in the New Testament, and they think, I'm giving you some of the critical opinions about this right now, they think that Jesus never totally delivered himself from the Old Testament way of thinking. And so in places like Matthew chapter 5, he gives us various rewards, but he sets conditions before them, just like Old Testament, that you do and you live. Thou shalt do this and then thou shalt live. Which, when interpreted improperly, makes works totally instrumental rather than partially instrumental. Your works are totally instrumental in gaining you whatever it is you desire. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake because here's a reward. All these are rewards. Matthew 5, verses 3 to 12. But I want to show you in a couple of passages where Jesus contradicts that in some of the parables that he gives that there is not, you can not always draw a definite proportional line between the works that you've done, the good deeds that you've done, and the blessings that you have. That would have to be true if works are meritorious. The more that you do good, the more that you're blessed with. For instance, in Matthew chapter 20, this parable of the laborers, the man's field, remember how the man goes out certain times of the day and hires people to go and to work in his field. I'm not turning over there. You can if you're not familiar with the passage. I'm looking at the next one we're going to turn to here in a moment. But... Remember, he goes out at different times, and he starts off with some, you know, early in the morning, and they work through the whole day. And he goes out later on in the day and hires someone, and he works just a short period, a few hours until the end of the day. And when payment time comes, what are they paid? They're all paid equal. So that destroys right away the notion that Jesus taught that works are totally instrumental and that works are always meritorious, that whatever you do, you're going to gain in direct proportion to that these various rewards in heaven. Matthew 20 will shoot holes in that because they all went out at different times. Some of them didn't work very long at all. But because of the grace of the man, the payer, the one who gave them their fee for that day, because of his grace, he gave the ones who didn't work very long as much as he had paid the others. And do you know what he said? He said, is it not my right do, to do what I will with what is my own, yeah. namely my money? I can pay whatever I want to. And if you don't want it, you shouldn't have worked for me then. I can pay whatever I want to. And then I want to give you another passage, Luke 17. We're looking at these only briefly because this gets into theology. Luke chapter 17 when the apostles ask him in verse 5, Lord, increase our faith. Now, this is a difficult parable to interpret here, but he gives them a teaching in verses 6 to 9. And then notice what he says in verse 10. So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded of you, then say, we are unprofitable slaves, we have only done that which was our duty to do. We haven't done anything that merits anything. Amen. We've only done what our duty was. Amen. And do you know what? You never arrive above that in Christianity. You never do any more that merits you something extra that you've done far beyond what God requires. No. If you've ever done anything and it's been right, it's only because that was your duty to do that and you've only performed your duty. People think, well, now, you know, this bottom line is my duty and if I do any above that, this is the Catholic doctrine of merits. It'll either gain me merits or gain someone else merits. Yeah. Or generally, it's not me that's so good. It's some saint that came before me who just lived such a saintly life that they gain merits enough to spill over for me and my family and my friends as well. 
And that destroys the teaching here in Luke 17, 10, that whenever you've done even your best, you've only done your duty. You haven't done enough to compensate for your sins. You haven't done enough to compensate for other people's sins. So how could you be talking about your own? So the works in no sense are meritorious. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 teaches that whatever we have is by grace through faith. So even the works that we do, we're studying the desire for reward as a proper motive. That's a good motive. You desire to be rewarded in the kingdom. But you're not just going to be rewarded in direct proportion to how many good deeds that you've done down here. Because what about the thief on the cross? He didn't do any good deeds, but I imagine he's got rewards in the kingdom. I didn't get any amens on that. Maybe your theology is a little suspect in that area then. He didn't get to do anything, but he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That got him rewards right there without doing anything at all. So no, you, there's not a direct proportion to what you do and what you're going to gain in the next life. Now that's not saying, you know, stop doing whatever you're doing. That's probably proof of the fact that you've got greater grace on your life or whatever. But if you'll turn over to Romans 2 and verse 7, I already gave you Romans 2, 5, and 6 for the first motive. But in Romans 2, 7, I want to show you where the Bible clearly sets it forth as being a proper motive for Christian conduct. Now, Romans 2, 5, and 6, speaking of the heathen, the man who has the hard, impenitent heart, and what is he doing? He's treasuring up unto himself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. We gave you that in the fear of chastening because this speaks of the lost man, not of the saved. Okay, look at verse 7 then. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing, okay, those of us who patiently continue in well-doing, look here, we're seeking for something. Why are we doing this? It's because we hope to be paid for what we're doing in the sense of heavenly rewards. Them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. That's what we're seeking for. I want glory. I want as much glory as I can get. I want the rewards, you see. There's, there's nothing sub-biblical about desiring the rewards until you place that as your chief motive. And the only reason you're doing anything is to ensure yourself whiter garments, a larger crown, more jewels, or a bigger mansion. Then you've missed the purpose of everything right there when your soul desires for these rewards. But we're using that, it's second from the bottom rung, but it's still important for you to remember that, that I don't know about you, but I'm doing these things because I want to be rewarded. Every good employer rewards his employee, and God's a good employer. He is going to reward us, both in this life and in the next as well. And in this life, it's going to include things like large families, health, prosperity, long life, peace with our enemies, Proverbs 16 teaches that. But not only in this life, it's going to be in the next life also. But he promises rewards such as in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 to those who what? Who overcome. That means we have to be doing something. We are in our well-doing, Romans 2, 7, seeking for glory and for honor and for immortality. And he promises you'll have eternal life, which will encompass all of these various things. So it's not meritorious, it's not merely instrumental, but nevertheless, the desire for reward is the proper motive. So why do you avoid speeding whenever you know you shouldn't be? Because you want to be rewarded in heaven for obeying Romans 13. But remember, keep that lower level, not higher level. That has to be kept lower level. But you still desire to be rewarded. I mean, a person's going to be a fool to say, I don't want any rewards, just let me into the kingdom. No, no one, none of us are going to do that. We want as many rewards as we can have, as many as we can get. You don't worry about how many you're going to get. You just live the best life you can under grace possible and let God take care of how many rewards and who gets what, and we don't fight over that. Okay, a third proper motive. A couple of these now will be brief that we go over before we get into some of the heavier ones, the latter ones. Why should you do right? You do right because of your love for good for its own sake because you love to do what's good and there's one verse that teaches this in Titus chapter 1 so it's the love of good for its own sake you see if you've been redeemed and you have the pure nature of God 
then you hate evil and you just love good because it's good. You don't just want to put some money in the offering because you're going to get rewards in, the heaven, in heaven for that or because you fear God's chastisement, but because you just love to do what's ever good. You like to stop and help somebody beside the road change their tire because that's a good thing to do. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a deeper essence here. It's an intangible. It's that's a good thing to do. You're not really doing that to get a reward, although you probably will. You're doing that because whatever is good and pure and lovely and just you enjoy doing things simply for its sake only because it's pure you're not trying to serve God better or something because your nature is pure you just enjoy doing good for good sake for the